Hey, this video is going to be all about the Visioneer cipher. So another encryption method, make sure you know what encryption is and also the Caesar cipher because this is essentially a modified version of the Caesar cipher. And it wasn't actually invented by Visioneer, it was invented by an Italian, Giovanni Bellasso in the 1500s and possibly before that because a lot of cryptography or classical cryptography was sort of people just doing it as a hobby and so they don't necessarily publish their work. But either way, this was a fairly, a fairly old cipher, so about 500 years old but it was only really cracked about 200 years ago in the 19th century, but it was still occasionally used up until the First World War, mostly because of its simplicity. Okay, let's see how this works. And first of all, just recap the Caesar cipher. So what this encryption method does is it shifts each letter by a set number of places. So it's a substitution cipher. So we're replacing a letter with another letter just further down the alphabet. So for example, we've got plain text, hello world. We've got a key of F and we apply this shift and we end up with a scrambled up ciphertext. And before in the Caesar cipher video, I was using the shift in terms of just a number. We can now just replace it with a letter. So each letter is representing a number. So starting from A, which is zero, all the way up to Z, which is 25. So zero through to 25, each letter has a number and F is represented by five. So we could just replace this by five and say, okay, we're shifting it by five each time. And just a, an example of part of the alphabet, which is shifted. So we've got uh, what appears here. So we've got two L's here. L is now replaced with Q. And so we end up with two Q's in the ciphertext. Hopefully this idea isn't new to you, but perhaps replacing it with a letter might be, but we're just representing the shift with a letter which corresponds to a number starting from zero and moving up the alphabet. The Visioneer cipher differs because it's using several Caesar ciphers repeatedly. So several shifts but now using a key that isn't a single character, it's now several characters. So we've got a string as our key. And for this example, let's use key as our key. And each of these values like up here has got a numerical representation. So 10 is for K is 10, E is four and Y is 24. So those are the shifts that are being represented by that letter in the, stri in the key. So we've got the same plain text, different cipher text because the process is a little bit different. So what we're doing is we're now using a string as our key. That's the first notable difference. But now we're going to repeat this key along the length of the plain text. So up in Caesar cipher, we're applying the same shift to every letter in the plain text. But now we're using, we're essentially laying out the key. Uh, it, it, just, it repeats. So the first character is using the shift of the first character of the key, and then second and third, and then because the key is only three letters long, it repeats itself. So you can see that the neighboring characters are using a different shift. So H is using 10, E is using four, and L is using 24, and then it repeats again. Just one thing to point out while we're on this page, you can see the comparison between the two. Here we've got the two L's are both represented by the same character, but notice how the two L's down here now have different characters in the ciphertext. So here it's quite obvious there's a repeating character, but now we're not, we don't know that's a repeating character because they both have different shifts applied to them. Just to lay this out maybe a bit bigger, we have the same plain text, hello world, and we now have what is known as the key stream. So the key stream is this long string of repeats of the key. So key is our key, and then the repeated uh, number of keys that matches the length of the plain text is our key stream. We're converting the characters here to their numerical equivalents and adding them to each other. So the numerical equivalents, i.e. K is representing 10 and E is representing four. So this is four plus four. So we're using the eighth character, which is I. Remember, we're starting counting from zero. So this is what we end up with. This is our cipher text and it's more robust than Caesar cipher. To decrypt, all we're doing is the opposite process. So here we're adding the key to the plain text. We'd then subtract the key stream from the ciphertext to get our plain text back. It's quite tedious, but ultimately very simple to do. The number of possibilities there are is relevant if you want to break this by brute force. So for Caesar cipher, there are only 25 possibilities. So very, very easy to break by brute force. But here it's in terms of the length of the key. So it's 26 to the power of however long the key is. So in this case, it's three. So 26 to the power three is much longer than 25, obviously but the longer the key, the better generally. However, there is quite a key weakness of Visionaire and this is all about the repeating key. So it's better than Caesar Cipher for sure, but having a repeating key stream does lead to patterns. So when the cipher text is very long, because there are lots of repeated characters in English, so for example, two L's here, 
like for th in the and this and there that th could line up perfectly and be repeated further down the line and this is exacerbated when the ciphertext is long so short ciphertext is very hard to analyze but if you have a very long ciphertext you can spot patterns and work out the length of the key and then work out what the key is from that i'd like to be able to try and show you this briefly to explain it fully would take another 10-15 minutes which we don't need to do so i just want to roughly show you how you can break it and i'm using a, a software tool called crypt tool which does all the hard work for you so we've got some text here this is our plain text if we encrypt it using uh let's use the key of key so our key is key we encrypt it and we end up with random ciphertext. When we zoom in and look at the first sentence, you can see that we've got two instances of cipher and they both are encrypted to the same value because the key repeats and their multiples are free. So the key is being used here and then it's being used again. So we've got quite lucky, it's sort of a coincidence, but we can exploit this along with other patterns to find out the key length. So we can run um, some analysis using this software and it derives the key length to be nine, so it's not quite correct, but it is a multiple. Uh, so it's actually, we can tell it and give it a hint, which is actually free. Uh, and then it will derive the key and we can decrypt it. So looking at this graph, what it's doing is it's, it's counting the offset between the patterns. So the offset between the patterns here is just three characters. And because the key is very short, this graph is not normal. Usually this graph has a few really high peaks and you can use those peaks to derive the key length and then use the key length to do frequency analysis and find the key. So that will take more time to explain than we want to, but essentially it's using this graph to look for multiples of the key length. So we saw it, it derived it as nine, but there might also be an 18 offset um, and so on. So we can use that to work backwards and find the key, but essentially the issue is because of a repeating key stream, it does produce patterns which we can use to work backwards.